capturing one frame at a time on a manual camera that she's had since the 80s that she focuses with a tape measure. This week on Make It, we're talking with Lois Greenfield, and we'll see how she captures her magical moments of dancers dancing. <laughs> Hey, Lois. Hi. How are you doing today? Good. 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 Thanks for coming out and uh, being on the show. Really excited. I'm a big fan of your work, so it's really awesome to have you here. Great to be here. Yeah. So uh, for those folks that haven't been yet uh, familiarized with your work, tell us about you and your photography. Well, it's based in dance. It's not literally that I'm photographing dances, but I'm using dancers for their own expressive potential and movement. And so how did you get into that? Has this been something you've been shooting your entire professional career? Or? Pretty much, although I started out, I wanted to be a photojournalist, and then I became a travel photographer, and I worked for newspapers, and then all of a sudden I was assigned to cover a dance concert, and I said, hey, you know, it's not bad. I'm not telling a journalistic story. I don't have to have a point of view. I just get to take things that are lyrical and beautiful. And then I rebelled against that <laughs> and said, I don't want to just take something that the audience can see sitting in their chair. I want to use photography to transform the subject matter into something that's uniquely photographic, mm -hmm. i.e. something you can't see with your naked eye, but you can see by virtue of, you know, a, a, in a photograph because you've caught something at a two thousandth of a second and it may look surreal, but it actually happened. How did you go from like just seeing this this scene that you wanted to take a picture of and, and feeling that that resonance to actually saying, well, let's make this a career, and then how did you make that successful? I think the main breakthrough for me was I started to bristle at actually taking documentary photos of dances, mm. and it was too literal for me. My allegiance was not to dance, it was mm. to photography. So I, I thought, how can photography make some unique hybrid mm. out of these two art forms, there's dance and there's photography, and they're not easy bedfellows mm -hmm. because one is happening in space and time and the other is got a guillotine shutter mm -hmm. that's extracting one split second. Whenever I look at your photos, it definitely feels like there's a huge amount of like intentionality to it, which almost makes me believe you were like, all right, you look exactly that way, you look exactly that way, you look exactly that way, yeah. do it again, no, do it again, no, do it again. <laughs> Well, we do do it again and again and again, <laughs> and in part because I only shoot one frame at a time. Mm -hmm. I don't use continuous action, and so for every phrase of movement, I'm taking one shot on my manual Hasselblad camera that I've had since the 80s mm -hmm. with no autofocus. We run with a tape measure right. to make the focus. It's a very counterintuitive way of working, but it's almost I'm probably seeing in slow motion because I have to decide to click the shutter mm -hmm. in anticipation that the next moment is going to resolve itself in something interesting. Right. How did you even figure this stuff out? Like, how did you well, get... Well, it's, it's just really instinct. Yeah. <clears throat> and I teach a lot of workshops right. in my studio, and I want everyone to use my camera on the tripod, not one of the SLRs. In the instances where people do use continuous action, they invariably don't get the moment that they were hoping because mm -hmm. they relinquish their decisive moment to the camera. Right. So I tell people, don't even look in the camera. If you're looking in the camera, right. you're waiting to see the action in the viewfinder, mm -hmm. at which point you've missed the opportunity mm -hmm. to take the picture. Were there certain pieces of art that you were influenced by that got you to feel that way, or is this just something that just felt natural to you? I, I feel they're like sculptures in the air. Right. You know, um, And there is something wonderful about just being in the air. It's not about jumping, and it's not about being a superhero. In fact, I actually shoot usually what's considered late, like the people are coming down a little because then their faces are relaxed mm. and it looks effortless. Right. And I know most people like to show the power of the body and right. the strength. And I'm like, no, yeah. these are just more angelic forms that are buffeted around by invisible winds. Right. And, the, and the idea, like a lot of the work that you were doing shot on the white background gives you like a, a lack of uh, kind of spatial uh, positioning. So you don't know, are they an inch off the ground? Are they 10 feet off the ground? Exactly. You don't even know where they are. I think another thing that was really interesting you mentioned is like when you were first shooting some of your work, it was when uh, like the, the super fast shutter speeds were, were just coming into fruition. And so mm -hmm. the combination of super high shutter speeds plus fast strobe lights created a certain kind of style or approach that many people hadn't seen before. Right, more the um, 
the, dura the flash duration. Mm -hmm. The shutter speed yeah, is, is nothing, yeah. except if you're outside in the right, sun, right. it's very important. But I was in a studio, so, so you can control um, it. Yes, it didn't really course. matter. And the thing is that the pictures look surreal to people mm -hmm. because the assumption is that when you're looking at this picture, the time you spend looking at it is equal to the duration of the event. Right, right. But it's not, yeah. because I didn't even see this happen. In right. it. Um, which is great, because you're, you're seeing things that you can't see with your naked eye. You can only, only right. exist as a photograph. This right. moment only exists. I so mean, this, this piece of art is, is, only per, is only perceptible. We can only see it in these photographs, which is great. Walk me through some of those um, evolutionary phases that you went through, through your professional career. Like you started off doing like this white background and then- Yeah, well, anti-gravity, I guess, you right. know, I was started working with acrobats and dancers doing impossible looking things. Right. And the fact that I was shooting it um, with the square format Hasselblad, mm -hmm. I kept the negative border mm -hmm. on it. So it yep. made a container right. and the dancers in a sense, by being contained by it related, there was a dramatic impact mm -hmm. of this. I mean, the square is, is the most inconvenient form for someone shooting a person, a person yeah. other than a portrait, you right. know. So I think when you have an obstacle like that, mm -hmm. like it's the wrong container for this subject and you put the two together, you do get something new. It creates some tension. That, it that creates has to the be. tension. Yeah. Exactly. All this stuff was shot with film. Right. I didn't look at a monitor to see what I was doing. Right, right. You know, you only found out after you developed the film and did the contact sheets and it didn't make a damn bit of difference mm. because I shoot digitally now and I can shoot more, mm -hmm. but they're not better. Are you uh, looking at the pictures as you're going or are you? I have try you, not you to. You try not to? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are two things. I always want the dancers' collaboration. Right. So the best way to get that is to invite them over to the monitor yeah. and see, oh, I did this and they change it and they have an idea and we talk about it. Whereas it's hard to believe, but in this era, I had Polaroid mm -hmm. that was two inches by two inches and a loop. Yeah. And I would use that to judge the picture and show the dancers. Right. Have you noticed any other differences um, besides like engagement with the photographer since you've gone digital? Well, I mean, I was always putting black and white film in except if um, a client wanted mm -hmm. color because I actually also did com commercial, a lot of commercial work. which And um, so now, I mean, I first got digital, I thought, oh, well, how can I convert it to black and white? But now I prefer actually shooting in color. Oh. And this, yeah, I mean, you got to evolve. I mean, I've been doing this since the 70s, and mm. it, I'm glad yeah. that I've, I've gone through all these iterations. You mentioned, like, your, your uh, lighting with, like, a single light. And I think yeah. you have, like, a new series that you, you're you yeah. working on in, in your book. Is that right? Yeah, in the new book, <clears throat> which is Lois Greenfield Moving Still, basically it's this one overhead light. And what's great about it is, there's so much fall off that it creates the, the sculpture mm -hmm. and the shadows. Right. And of course, I've got my attention to the moment. So here I have two assistants waving ordinary um, kitchen string. Yeah, that's really cool. And the dance, oh, I love this photo. I love it. And you can even see, by the way, I do not recombine or recomposite. Everything is a single frame, a right. single image. There's a string going behind her and going right through her hair. Oh, wow. That's yeah. so cool. And I've always been madly in love with mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, they really expand the perspective of the camera because the camera sees what the lens sees, mm -hmm. but the mirrors include things outside mm -hmm. the frame. Right. These two dancers are jumping with um, mirrors. Right. And of course you have to look closely, you see all the, uh, the reflections set. nested, yeah. you know, and the outside. All these pictures were really taken out of, a, you know, a love for that project. But I do also work for dance companies. Right. And so this was taken for a company. And what the dance actually was, was this dancer in a huge cage. And all these shredded Taiwanese newspaper clippings were blown around this kind of batting cage with about 20 fans. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the premise is the dance, but once the fans started attaching the papers to his face, oh, I just screamed, stop, you know, stop. <laughs> Do not move anymore, this is it. <laughs> That's definitely one of those, you can't reproduce this. <laughs> no, you can't. And I, I mean, again, I don't like to label my pictures in any way, but I look at him, I feel like he's the god of creation or chaos or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe that's what attracts me is something chaotic. So you brought a, a big print for us, which is always fun. And I think you were mentioning in your one-to-one -one series, you're, yes. you're actually printing them large because they have this interesting interaction and engagement that you can you can have mm -hmm. with it and mm -hmm. getting closer to life size with some of the yeah. people. So, but what was also neat about this is you had mentioned before, you, you don't do compositing. Everything is shot in frame. So 
Tell us about how you accomplished this shot, because it seems right. impossible. This dancer is doing this head headstand, whatever you want to call it, and of course he can only hold it for a split second. I didn't realize at the time that throwing in the styrofoam balls would have the connotation of two spheres of gravity, and that's, I suppose, what, what holds my interest now. He threw a couple of the balls, and then I had an assistant, and as he went up to do that, they threw in the balls, and then I had to tell them, make sure you, you aim it so it's going to be around right. his feet. Right. And I think what's super cool is the shadowing on the balls, which give them that planetary look. They're right. not just white, they're sculptural. Right. Do you have these sent out? Are you printing at home? What are you doing? How are you getting these big prints? Yeah, no, I don't think I could send them out. We definitely do it at the studio um, with my Epson 9000 printer. And, uh, you know, there's so much futzing around, you know, with the tonalities, yeah. even though it's it's digital. And I mean, yeah. it is like going in a, in a dark room and burning right. and dodging in a sense. So right. I really like to have that control mm -hmm. of doing it myself. Yeah. Thank you for, for bringing that in. Let's, let's go take a look at some of your other photos that you brought. <laughs> well, what's going on here? Yeah, well, it's interesting. This was actually a commercial assignment that was based on an image that was in my Breaking Bounds book, and an advertising agency saw the metaphoric potential for selling watches. Oh, interesting. Because it's all about, their tagline was precision movements. Mm -hmm. so, so this is very precise and very movement-y, so yes, perfect. Yes, it's precise and imprecise at right. the same time. This was another commercial shot for JVC Jazz Festival, who asked me to create the poster for that year's Jazz mm -hmm. Festival. And it's, it's really, by the way, great for a photographer to get commercial work based on their artwork. So I said, well, my idea for this poster would be we would have a dancer, a gymnast, um, like an angel flying in to play the double bass. And I didn't know how I was ever going to pull this off, but I thought it sounded like a good idea. So this shot was actually taken not during the shoot, but during a casting session mm -hmm. where I had all potential gymnasts come and try out. So we had this uh, big expensive base um, propped up with a little bit of putty behind it and held by an assistant. Right. At some point, the gymnast was going to go up, go horizontal, hold the frets while the assistant jumped out, of course, so as not to be in the picture. And then when the dancer was going to let go, the assistant would come in and, and keep the right. dress from falling. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of your other uh, photos sure. on here. We can just... Oh, well, this is really interesting because I like to treat my dancers as sculptures. Now, a painting, you can't walk around. You go into a museum, you get one perspective on a painting hanging mm -hmm. on the wall. Right. But a sculpture, unless it's, you know, crammed into a corner there, you can circumnavigate. So I like to try that with dancers, and it's something I encourage, mm -hmm. you know, photographers to do. You're not locked into one singular perspective. So you get a radically different picture. Mm -hmm. um, this is a side view, and this is the other view. So you have two radically different pictures of the same move. Let's see, what else do we got? Early on, working, shooting dress rehearsals in theaters before I developed my own approach, I realized that it was hard for the dancer to create movement without fabric, because mm. the fabric showed the trajectory right. of the arms or legs. Yeah, because like if, if you have the arm up here, you don't know where it started no. from. Right. So if you take the scarf out of this picture, it's a beautiful arabesque by a beautiful dancer, but it's still kind of a static moment. Mm. And there's another one, right? Yes, there's another one too. And again, it is transformative if you look at this picture without the scarf. It doesn't tell the story, it doesn't have the mystery or the ambiguity. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I think that there were um, a couple things maybe that you wanted to share with us, a couple of ideas for how you can maintain your spontaneity. And, and Yeah, don't put the pressure on yourself to be creative and fresh. Oh, I'm putting the pressure on you right now. Yeah. No, but, um, but don't put the pressure on yourself. Exactly. <laughs> And don't get discouraged if you go off. I go off on some t path that right. is leading nowhere, but that's okay. You know, you could just make a U-turn or, or something like that. If I knew what the picture was going to look like, I wouldn't bother to take it. Mm -hmm. For me, the journey is to get beyond my imagination mm -hmm. and come up with a picture I never would have thought of. Mm -hmm. Many photographers think they have to come in with a layout or a fixed idea in mind that they're going to convey to the subject. I'm the complete opposite, as you know. And I think that it limits 
the potential of what they could shoot. If you're more comfortable with a layout, I think it's great. And you could start with a layout, and then I would tell people, okay, you've done the layout, right. now let's break it up a little. Mm -hmm. But no one should feel that they need to have that concept. Right. If you don't have it, don't use that as an excuse not to go take photos. Right, because it will happen mm -hmm. on its own. And in fact, in my case, <clears throat> it blossoms faster and better mm -hmm. because I'm not confining and, and containing it. And you know, bring the subject matter over. Now, people may not want to do that. Mm -hmm. Photographers may feel shy about it or, or think they know best or not want the, to rattle the subject, but I always bring the, the dancer over to the monitor and say, what do you think? They say, oh, wow, but I could do it this way. Mm -hmm. Or I say, you're too crowded here. Okay, let me go there. So I think the moment you put your subject at ease and allow them to be themselves, whether it's a portrait or a dance shot or fashion or whatever, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're going to be better off. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Lois. Really appreciate you coming by uh, today and joining us, sharing your photos and your approach. And thank you, everybody at home, for joining us. We'll see you next time.